All right, we are live, I think. So welcome everybody to the uh, almost last talk of the summit. <laughs> Congratulations to those of you that, that made it this far and are still standing upright. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about interoperability today and sort of the mechanics of how uh, we go about determining what goes into uh, OpenStack's interoperability guidelines. Um, so let's start off with a little background about why we care about all this in the first place. So if you've seen uh, some of the material published by the TC, you know that OpenStack aims to be a ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform that will meet the needs of public and private clouds regardless of size, yada, 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 right? Um, perhaps inherent in that ambition is the promise of some level of interoperability. So if we're using this thing to build lots of different cl clouds and lots of different kinds of clouds, um, part of the promise there is that uh, we'll have some level of interoperability between them, and that's one of the benefits that you get by using it. Um, so hopefully code that you write up against one set of capabilities, APIs, et cetera, uh, works on many different places, right? Well, as it turns out, clouds that on some level are the same, that are built from the same code, can wind up acting and looking very differently from one another. OpenStack has a whole lot of nerd knobs. Um, this stat is a little out of date now, uh, but as of late 2015, um, there were over 4,600 config options in just the TC approved release projects. So not counting some of the uh, ones that aren't, aren't as widely deployed, but are still important to some people, right? Um, and there were over 1,000 uh, policy.json configurations, and that's just the ones that ship with, in, in the defaults, right? Uh, in default packaging. Um, you can add more. Um, so obviously a whole lot of, of flexibility in the way uh, you control your cloud. Uh, and then it turns out people also put things in front of their clouds and on top of their clouds, things like firewalls, load balancers, API gateways, uh, all kinds of uh, stuff that goes uh, uh, between you and a cloud. Uh, and the mechanics of what's under the hood obviously behave, uh, can change behaviors as well. Um, different hypervisors support different image formats. Uh, different storage has different capabilities. Different SDM platforms have different capabilities. And of course, there's many different kinds of workloads that use different clouds in different ways as well. And at the end of the day, what developers want is to be able to write code against all of that. So let's talk about the vendor perspective first. Um, so most people that are using OpenStack clouds today are getting them from a vendor, um, whether it's a distribution, a managed service, or even a public cloud. Um, so vendors uh, increasingly need to be aware of the interoperability concern. Um, and it's something we've seen starting to crop up in, in some of the talks we've had with consumers of OpenStack as well. First of all, it's good for the users of the products. Uh, it helps promote the product, uh, and it helps applications to be developed on the platform. Fostering an ecosystem around OpenStack is probably the most important thing that we can do for OpenStack uh, in terms of uh, its traction in the, in the rest of the world. Uh, and by the way, it's now required if you want to call your product OpenStack. This is what we do not want developers to have to write ever. <laughs> Um, if, if OpenStack clouds have no level of interoperability, this is what you wind up uh, doing. Just to get a list of images, you might have to go through uh, a, a five, or, five or six line deep if-else loop to figure out what works on your given cloud. Uh, and keep in mind that that may change over time as well, as new API versions roll out, uh, as different vendors uh, move faster than others in adopting new releases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is a bad developer experience and what we do not want. So what's in a guideline? Um, we mentioned interoperability guidelines. Uh, That's kind of the premise of the talk here. Um, interoperability guidelines uh, are produced by the Interop Working Group, of which I'm the co-chair. Um, they list the capabilities that products calling themselves OpenStack have to support, the tests they must pass in order to prove it, uh, and the, a list of designated sections of the OpenStack code that they must use to provide those capabilities. So basically, there's three important facets here. One is a list of things that a cloud has to do that end users can use. Two is a list of tests they have to pass so that they prove that they do it in the same way as others. And third is a list of code that they have to use to back that capability uh, so that users know they're actually getting OpenStack code and not you know, some, some strange Java fork of OpenStack that implements the API. Uh, and there's also a few other things in the guidelines. There's a list of exceptions, uh, things that we found problems with, uh, and things that might be required in the future so that you can start looking ahead to what you may be able to consume in an operable way in the future. Cadence guidelines, they roll out every six months. They are offset from OpenStack releases by a couple of months, um, so that each guideline covers three and a half releases. Uh, basically, because of that offset, um, when we roll out a new guideline, we will approve it for uh, the current uh, head in master, uh, and that will become a new release before the next guideline rolls out. 
Um, the newest two can be used by a vendor if they want a logo uh, or a trademark uh, agreement from the OpenStack Foundation. So when we talk about what's in the interoperability guidelines, we also have to talk about what's not in the interoperability guidelines. So some things that you will never find in interoperability guidelines are stuff that end users don't see or can't use. These are primarily focused on end users of clouds. Uh, because that's the uh, sort of the purpose that it was created for. So you're not going to see admin-only APIs in there. You're not going to see RPC APIs. You're not going to see database schema. You're not going to see HA requirements. These are things that users can't see and don't consume directly. Um, obviously, it supports what they're doing, uh, but these are not things that consumers of a cloud would touch. Uh, and so you won't find those in the guidelines today. Uh, you also won't find stuff that's intentionally made pluggable by OpenStack. So for example, you will never see an OpenStack guideline that requires KVM, uh, or requires Open vSwitch, or requires uh, some particular storage platform. Um, those are all things that OpenStack intentionally abstracts from the user. Um, so when we look at capabilities, uh, if we find out that, gosh, of the 80 Cinder drivers out there, this capability is only supported by three of them, probably never going to make it into a guideline, right? It needs to be stuff that's actually uh, uh, works across uh, what's under the hood. Because again, that's not directly exposed to end users. Um, you also find, won't find stuff that doesn't have tests. Uh, remember earlier, it's great to say that you support these things, uh, but we also need a test to ensure that that behavior actually works across clouds. Uh, and you also usually won't find stuff that's being deprecated. Uh, occasionally, what we find is that um, stuff that is on the path to deprecation uh, stays there for a long time uh, to give the, the sort of tooling ecosystem around OpenStack a chance to adapt to whatever's coming next. Um, so those may, may stick around in the guidelines temporarily, but they'll generally uh, have some kind of uh, flag or disclaimer in there, uh, warning about that. <clears throat> so how do we decide what goes into these things? Um, at the end of the day, it boils down to uh, three important things. Uh, first, there's a list of 10 guiding principles. There's a list of 12 core criteria. And then there's this giant list of tests. Um, so all the tests that you see run in the OpenStack gates are, are potentially fair play for this. Uh, we look primarily at what's in Tempest. Um, we've also had some interest in uh, using in-project tree tests that, are, that have a Tempest plugin interface. Uh, but primarily, we look at Tempest first. Um, and we'll also mention that new capabilities have to go through an advisory phase. Uh, basically, the first time they go into one of these guidelines that rolls out every six months, they're marked as advisory. Uh, and that's kind of a signal to the rest of the community, hey, if you're a vendor or an OpenStack deployer uh, or an OpenStack end user, this is something that's going to be required in the future. Um, so if, for example, you are making an OpenStack-powered product, um, this is something that you're going to be required to expose your users uh, at some point in the future. Uh, if you're a consumer of clouds, this is something you can count on being interoperable in the near future. Um, so the most important of those is probably the interop criteria. So um, let's take a look at these. Um, like I say, there are 12 criteria. Uh, they're kind of lumped into four different buckets here. Um, and you can see kind of in the circle in the center there uh, what they're sort of attempting to prove. Uh, so for example, one of the things that we want is capabilities that show proven usage. Um, so we're not sort of um, requiring stuff that nobody ever touches or cares about, right? Um, there are three criteria related to that bucket. One is that it is widely deployed. Uh, and for that, we look at things like what products support it. Uh, do we get user survey feedback uh, from people that say this is things that they use? We also look at whether it's used by tools. Uh, so things like, say, SDKs like, say, JClouds or, or Fog, uh, or maybe cloud providers for things that you would put on top of OpenStack, like, say, the cloud provider for Kubernetes. Uh, we also look at what's used by clients. Um, if a new API is introduced in OpenStack and it doesn't have support in OpenStack client and it doesn't have a Horizon interface, and the only way to get to it is directly through the API, it's probably not ready to go into an interoperability guideline. Uh, maybe somewhere down the road when, when that gets done. Um, so you can kind of see the universe of, of things here. Uh, basically, we're looking for things that have proven usage in the real world. They align well with the technical direction that OpenStack is going in. They take a system view of the entire um, uh, sort of uh, whole cloud, uh, and they play well with others. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on, on the systems view one, because uh, that one's one that tends to need a little bit of explanation. Um, fundamentally, we're looking for things that are, are foundational. Um, and what we mean by foundational is they're sort of core capabilities that everybody's going to want, need, or use. And when I say everybody, sometimes I'm talking about other pieces of OpenStack code. Uh, so for example, um, very high level abstraction, um, it's awfully hard to use Nova if you don't have the ability to get an image into your cloud somehow, because then you can't actually boot anything, right? Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's built in around uh, things like basic operations of creating images, creating servers, uh, sort of those kind of things. 
Um, we also look for things that are uh, both atomic and proximate. Um, atomicity has to do with um, uh, sort of having a, a single, single small piece of functionality uh, rather than being sort of a, a, a bunch of operations kind of lumped into one. Uh, and proximity has to do with what other things call on that. Uh, so for example, um, it wouldn't make a lot of sense if we put create resource into uh, the OpenStack guidelines and didn't also have delete and read and update. So those things are proximate to one another. Uh, if you have one, it kind of makes sense to have them all. So how do these things get written and, and how do we decide what goes in there? Um, phase one is we start talking to each other. Um, we'll talk about the timeline for all this in a minute, but um, usually the first thing we do when we start looking at capabilities for a new guideline is we go talk to the technical community. Uh, typically the way that works is the interoperability work group kind of hands out assignments. Um, we have volunteers that uh, volunteer to work with, say, the Nova community or the Glance community or whoever it is. Uh, they'll go talk to the PTLs and the developers and, and other folks from those development teams and say, hey, look, what do you think is important? What's missing from the guidelines today? What do you think has been introduced in the last few cycles that people really are fundamentally going to want to use in the future uh, that we need to consider a, a sort of uh, core capability for interoperability? Uh, and that's where the discussion starts. Um, we also generally talk to end users. Um, a lot of us you know, happen to work for vendors, uh, so we talk to people that are using our stuff in the field as well. Um, we try to get as much perspective on this as we can. So phase one is really all about talking to each other. Part two is we actually start writing things down. Um, the way this works is that we uh, create patches in Garrett. Um, so the interoperability work group works with the same set of tools that uh, most projects in OpenStack do. Uh, and I thought we might just swap over to a browser real quick and take a, a look at what that looks like. Um, so this is a, a patch uh, that went into the interoperability work group um, a, couple, a few months ago. Um, and you can see this is pretty much the standard, standard Garrett stuff, right? Um, so we have approvals, we have plus twos, we have plus ones, we have a long string of discussions. Uh, you can see in this case the Nova PTL chimed in on this patch. Um, what it starts with uh, is a simple text file. Um, so we have a text file, uh, and you'll see over on the kind of right-hand side in the green there, uh, there's columns of numbers, and they're binary. They're ones and zeros. Um, those columns, if you look further up the text file, uh, those column headers are the 12 criteria that we just talked about earlier. So basically, somebody will go in and put in their opinion of, yes, this is proximate. Yes, this is atomic. Yes, this is widely deployed. No, it is not foundational, blah, 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 right? Uh, and then we have a little script that tallies up all the scores at the end of the day. Uh, and if it meets some minimum threshold that we determine for each cycle, um, it's going to wind up going into those, those guidelines. Uh, in this case, you'll see one uh, here was marked with an 82, uh, which is, is high enough to get in. Um, and we'll see in the next file. Oh, this is just a CSV view of the same thing. And we'll see this advisory status here. Um, so basically, we have, we have three things that we looked at, we talked about, uh, sorted out with the community and decided that these are things that should go into our next interoperability guidelines. Uh, first, they go through an advisory phase, so that's why they're added here. Uh, and then toward the bottom, you'll see there's actually one that we dropped here. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Keystone, you know that they've uh, long since sort of moved on from uh, V2 of their API, uh, and that's a V2 API capability. And if we look a bit further down, we'll actually see tests associated with each of those. Um, so we'll see things like listing flavors, uh, and these are actually pointers to uh, Tempest tests. Uh, they actually have, uh, every test in Tempest actually has an identifier ID associated with it. It's kind of like a UID, uh, just a, a numerical identifier. So if the test changes names or changes locations, uh, we can still figure out where it is. All right, so once we've written it down, we've agreed to, agreed to it, we've put it through scoring, community's had a chance to give feedback on it, uh, we've decided to add something in. Uh, once all that is done for all the projects uh, and, and we're getting toward the end of that six month cycle, we bring it up to the board of directors. So I've kind of glossed over the governance model here a little bit, uh, but the Interop Working Group was actually created by the board of directors of the OpenSAC Foundation, and that is ultimately who has to approve everything that we do. Uh, that's a little different from a lot of the um, development projects in OpenStack, um, but the reason is because the board of directors is who controls the trademark. So if you want to use the OpenStack logo, if you want a, a legal agreement giving you the right to license that logo and put it on your product or call your product OpenStack, you have to talk to the OpenStack Foundation. So uh, this is one way that the OpenStack Foundation has put that governance process back into the community hands. Uh, so uh, anybody can come participate in the interop working group, um, and ultimately whatever we send up has to be approved by the board. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so let's talk a little bit more about tests. Um, there are a few requirements for the tests that we have today. Um, first of all, they have to be under TC governance. Uh, so generally for the, the core projects today, we don't accept tests that um, you know, some vendor wrote and runs on, a, on the side. Um, and that's primarily, again, because we want the testing to be in the hands of the community. Um, if the community decides that a test isn't useful uh, or, or isn't testing a capability in the way that it should, it's probably gonna get kicked out of Tempest, right? Uh, and if you look through our interoperability guidelines, most of the capabilities have multiple tests associated with them. Um, and so we can you know, add and remove from those over time. Um, all tests today are in Tempest. Uh, this is uh, kind of per the TC's request. The TC gave us uh, some guidance a while back that said um, anything that qualifies for the uh, future direction criteria uh, should be in Tempest. Um, well, I'll mention briefly that we are considering some new programs uh, for uh, vertical spaces and less widely deployed projects that may or may not have that uh, stipulation on them. Uh, but those are a uh, topic for a whole other talk. So we'll gloss over those for now. Um, they must work in all the releases covered by a guideline. So remember I mentioned that a guideline generally covers at least three releases. Um, that means that the tests must function against clouds running any of those three releases. Uh, and that also, of course, means that whatever capability we're testing has to be present in all three releases. Um, part of that goes into the fact that one of the criteria we have is that we're looking for things that are stable over time. Uh, so if a, a, an API is removed after six months of being in the real world, um, probably not something that we should require everybody to run. Um, never actually happens anymore, by the way. <laughs> anymore. It's not 2011. Um, Typically, we have folks run these via a RefStack wrapper. Uh, so there's another uh, OpenStack project called RefStack, uh, which is a, a sort of thin wrapper around uh, the Tempest project. Um, it will run the test for you and then report them upstream to a server somewhere. Uh, uh, so you can actually go out to refstack.openstack.org uh, and see which guidelines you meet. And we'll look at that now. So a brief look at what RefStack looks like. Um, so this is the public RefStack server. Uh, it is an OpenStack project, so you can go get the code and, and spin up one internally inside your firewall if you want. Uh, but this is the public one run by the OpenStack Foundation on its infrastructure. Um, what we're looking at right here is what's in a guideline. Uh, and again, you can see kind of the same things that we saw earlier, just in a, a more human-readable format, uh, as opposed to the, the JSON we saw earlier. Um, and this tells you a little bit about what's in those guidelines. You can see each of the capabilities listed. Uh, each one will have a set of tests associated with it. Uh, and then you can see which criteria it's stacked up against. Uh, and also which, which project it's related to. This is a view of an actual test run that somebody ran with RefStack. Uh, I happen to run this one, so I can speak a little bit about it. Um, what you can see here, there are a couple of drop downs for the guideline version. Uh, 2017.01 is the most recent guideline. And we can see right here, there's a nice green yes that says this cloud uh, passed all the required tests. And then for each of those, you can actually go into each individual test and see those as well. Okay. Um, so the next kind of natural question is, what if we get it wrong? What if it turns out we thought something was really widely deployed and then like we got a whole lot of feedback after it became required that, oh, hey, we don't pass that test because we don't ship that in our product. Or, uh, you know, it turns out uh, we don't uh, do that thing in a bunch of uh, roll your own clouds either. Um, there's always going to be circuit breakers and feedback loops in, in any process in OpenStack, and this is one of the ways that we can do that. Um, tests can be flagged uh, at any time, which means as soon as that uh, guideline goes out and it's, it's required of, of uh, uh, vendors, um, if we get feedback that it's not a good test, maybe it doesn't test things the way we thought it did, maybe it tests a different API than we thought it did, maybe a test has been deprecated and removed from Tempest at some point, um, whatever, whatever the reason is, um, if we get feedback about that, we can actually insert a flag into the guideline at any time without going back to the board for reapproval. Um, the flag marks the test as not required, uh, and then we can kind of decide that test fate in the future. Um, it may be that, you know, frankly, this capability was just a bad choice and we should, never should have chosen in the first place, in which case we'll drop it out of the next guidelines. Uh, in other cases, it turns out, well, you know, that test actually had a bug in Tempest, right? Um, so nobody's going to be able to pass it, and it's not that they don't support the capability, it's just a buggy test, uh, in which case that bug may get fixed in the future, uh, and at that point we'll drop the flag and it'll go back to being required. Um, so there's sort of a, a couple of bullets there uh, talking about thing, uh, reasons that we might flag a test. 
So let's talk about timelines. Um, typically, the timeline, uh, it's a little bit, little bit loose, but the timeline usually looks something like this. Uh, three months before a summit, uh, there's kind of a preliminary draft. It's usually a carbon copy of the last guideline uh, with a few numbers and names changed, uh, and that's kind of our starting point. Um, two months uh, after, uh, before summit, we'll start talking about new capabilities, uh, kind of going through that process of saying who on the interoperability work group is going to work with Nova this time around or, or whatever it is, kind of dividing and, and conquering uh, so we can get all the, all the projects that we need covered. Uh, about a month in, we'll start uh, scoring capabilities uh, and actually posting those patches up to Garrett. Uh, and by summit, we'll typically have a solid draft. If you look out uh, at the repository right now, excuse me, you'll see a file called next.json. Uh, almost all the patches that we have outstanding for that have now landed. Uh, so you got a pretty good picture of what the next interoperability guideline is probably going to look like. Um, so now that we've got a solid draft out there, uh, we'll have vendors uh, who are interested go start testing. Um, you can consume that uh, next.json file anytime you want, uh, but now it's kind of a good time to, to go because we've actually got everything uh, in there that we think is going to make it into the next guideline. Um, and that's, again, additional feedback loop. Um, we start letting vendors uh, run this and see, you know, oh, gosh, that test has a bug, or, uh, you know, this, this isn't a thing we support. Maybe we should get on that and fix that, um, those kind of things. Um, two months after summit, we'll probably, we, we usually do the test flagging. Uh, flagging can actually happen at any time, but this is kind of the point where we stop and take a look and uh, make sure that we don't have any outstanding requests before we send something up to the board of directors. Uh, and then finally, three months after summit, we'll have uh, a vote by the board of directors uh, that hopefully ends in approval, uh, if it's not too controversial. Um, if you look back in time, uh, just kind of a note at the bottom of the slide, if you look back in time, 2015 was a little bit weird in that we had a really accelerated schedule. That was kind of the origin of this whole process. Um, so we kind of moved fast and had a couple guidelines uh, in, in six months rather than uh, just one. So the next thing folks want to know is why isn't this thing that is really important to me in those interoperability guidelines? Why can't I depend on it to be there uh, across all the different clouds? There's not really an easy answer. <laughs> um, so it's a little dependent on, on each individual thing. So you remember the requirements that we laid out earlier. It could be that it just didn't meet criteria. It may be super important to you, but may not be applicable to you know, 60, 80% of the rest of the clouds out there. Um, in which case, it's not a thing that we'd probably feel comfortable requiring of everyone. Um, it may just not have been scored in time. Uh, it turns out there's a whole lot of research that goes into the scoring usually. Um, I know I've spent a whole lot of time digging around in like J clouds and fog and, and Kubernetes and trying to figure out how they're using clouds and what capabilities they're using. Um, so that actually does take some time. Uh, and again, there's a lot of time spent conversing with the rest of the community as well. Uh, it may be that it was an admin only capability. Uh, again, we're focused on the things that uh, consumers of clouds can use. Uh, so if it's only available to administrators, probably not a thing we're going to get here. Um, and in kind of an important corollary to that uh, is that there are some Tempest tests that uh, test capabilities that end users typically can use, uh, but they're written in such a way that they use admin credentials to do so. Uh, and so there's no way that an end user of, say, a public cloud um, could actually run that same test and get it to pass, because he does not have admin access to the cloud. So in those cases, uh, we can't include the test. What we can do is start a feedback loop there, file a bug on the test, and say, look, this uses admin credentials for no good reason. Let's fix it. Um, and that has happened more than once. Um, it may be that the project itself wasn't widely deployed. Um, people ask about Designate a lot lately. Um, Designate is, as of the last user survey, I think is deployed in about 16% of prod and non-prod uh, OpenStack clouds in the user survey. Again, important to some people, uh, and we do have some new add-on programs coming that will, will help uh, guarantee some interoperability for them. Uh, but probably not applicable for uh, the, the whole uh, rest of the universe. It may be that there are some things that don't have tests, uh, or maybe it didn't score highly enough across all releases covered in a guideline. Uh, so again, we're looking at at least three releases in each one of these guidelines. Uh, it may be that in uh, the earliest of those releases, something really didn't have good client support yet. Um, so people running you know, that version of the cloud um, may, not, may not have good support for it yet. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of nobody's brought this up. Um, you know, we're, we're a bunch of the users in the community and we try to have a good read on what things people are using, but sometimes there are gaps. Um, so again, there's a lot of feedback loops built in there uh, and we just hope that the, uh, the feedback comes. All right, so if I'm an OpenStack developer, I've got a really cool feature. How do I get it into those guidelines? There's a blog you should read. <laughs> uh, the link's at the bottom there, um, but to summarize it, um, what we need that capability to do is meet all the guidelines, uh, all the capabilities that we use to determine what goes into the guidelines. 
Um, so you can do things like document it really well, uh, help foster adoption of it. Uh, you know, if, you, if the feature is completely undocumented, there's a good chance nobody's ever going to use it. Um, it may be that you can help foster adoption by doing things like helping other people use it via an SDK. Uh, maybe you can submit a patch to, say, JClouds or uh, work in um, Kubernetes or, or some other thing that uses clouds. Um, if, if lots of tools are depending on it, uh, it makes it easier for us to include. Um, we've already talked about tests. Uh, and then, of course, you also need to be a little bit patient. Uh, again, this has to be in three releases. Uh, so if you have a new shiny object that uh, just went into the latest release, it's going to be a while. Um, so feedback loops. Um, again, lots of, lots of feedback loops built in um, to the scoring cycles. Um, anybody can come comment on our patches in Garrett. Uh, you can throw in your, your minus one, plus one. Um, the board of directors also gets a chance to offer their feedback. Um, most of this originates with talking with the rest of the community and talking with the PTLs and, and the development groups to see what they think is core. Uh, and then even after something becomes advisory or required, there's another feedback loop built in there where vendors can ask for flags uh, if we find out that there's problems. Um, so plenty of, plenty of ways to, to do that. Um, also kind of important to mention, um, one of the things that we use when we're looking at uh, some of these criteria is the user survey. Uh, and we also look at RefStack to see uh, what test results are out there and what they actually support. Um, so things that you can do uh, are, if you're running a cloud, answer the user survey. Uh, and, and that way we'll know that a lot of people are running Designator or, or whatever project it is, right? Uh, and if you submit your test results via RefStack, then we can also see, oh, there's a cloud that supports all these other capabilities that we haven't even thought about yet. Uh, and if it turns out there's a lot of those, maybe that's the thing we should think about. <clears throat> Uh, and of course, you may also buy me a beer and bend my ear about that anytime. Um, quick notes about RefStack, because uh, we're running a little low on time. Um, it's actually not very hard to make RefStack work. There's some instructions. Uh, there's a link in the, in the slides. Basically, you go download, download the RefStack client, uh, run, a, run a setup script, um, configure Tempest for your cloud, point Tempest at it, uh, it executes the tests, and it uploads them to RefStack. Uh, there are now capabilities in RefStack where you can upload results anonymously or with uh, kind of a, an association to your user ID uh, so that you can only see them uh, and make them public later. One thing that we've uh, been encouraging people to do is run not just the tests that are required in the current guidelines, but run all the tests. Um, frankly, if you're going to take the time to, to run a couple hundred tests, what's a couple hundred more? Um, it's a, maybe an extra hour of your time, right? Uh, and you're probably going to go, go have a cup of coffee in that time anyway. Um, the more data we have about what's out there and what clouds, uh, what other tests clouds pass, the better decisions we can make about scoring later on. Uh, if you don't pass all the tests, it's important not to panic. Um, a lot of times uh, we figure out that uh, some of the problems that people have are environmental. Uh, maybe there's a timeout because their storage was slow or uh, on their, their particular test bed. Uh, it turns out test beds a lot of times are not built with like first class gear. They're built with like the server you found in the closet, you know? Um, so sometimes it's just purely environmental. Uh, sometimes we find bugs in tests. Sometimes we find bugs in OpenStack. Um, there's plenty of reasons why, why tests may fail. Um, we actually have people who will come help you with that. One of them is the interoperability engineer at the OpenStack Foundation, whose email address is right here on this slide. So don't panic. Uh, a few links where you can learn more. Uh, our two most recent board approved guidelines are at the top there, uh, as well as the next guideline draft. Uh, and links to all the stuff that uh, I showed you in the slides here uh, is there as well, including how to submit patches uh, if you're interested in uh, adding capabilities to future interop guidelines. So that's it. Do what I do. Hold on tight. Pretend it's a plan. And uh, hopefully we'll have some interoperable clouds in the near future. And that's all I've got. Uh, any questions? I think we have about one minute. <laughs> all right. In that case, thanks for coming. Have a safe flight home. <laughs>